in the number of cases in 10 to 19 year old age group and evidence has demonstrated that this is an age group that is highly likely to transmit disease. So what does this mean for childhood summer activities and return to school? It means we must be very cautious. Do our kids need to play all the sports and do all the activities this summer that they have in past? Certainly not. Can our children get sick and can they spread disease widely in the community to those more likely to get severely ill? Absolutely. However, as the county executive said, our kids do need to be educated. There's a balance between the risk of contracting disease or spreading disease and having children receive essential education. However, these don't have to be mutually exclusive choices. Our children can get a good education while we as a community are responsible in managing this pandemic. However, this means that we must restructure the built environment of schools. Being flexible with virtual options, spacing children out physically in the classroom, keeping them in smaller groups to minimize the likelihood of spread, and having our children and teachers wear masks. This last component has been absent in some recent school reopening plans. Masks are a simple yet essential tool to control the spread of disease. In school, as well as in public, masks should no longer be a debate. Around the country, we've seen that those who were previously opposed to masks one by one change viewpoints when the burden of disease in their community becomes overwhelming. Let us in Milwaukee County be ahead of the curve and wear masks before we are forced to by unmanageable positivity rates and hospitalizations. Thank you and stay safe. And I will hand it off to Commissioner Kowalik. Good afternoon. Thanks, Dr. Weston. So I know that there's a lot of buzz about kids back to school, um, who's allowing what, the city of Milwaukee versus the other jurisdictions in Milwaukee County and the surrounding areas. So obviously there's a lot going on. So I wanna be able to provide some context behind all of the movements that have happened up until this point, as well as some of the points that our county executive and Dr. Weston noted on what we need to do in the future. So I first want to just acknowledge how our COVID-19 outbreak response began. So everybody knows Friday the 13th was the day we detected our first case in the county and the city. But I don't know if you recall over the weekend, on the Saturday, so the following day, the 14th, uh, Dr. Posley, the superintendent of Milwaukee Public Schools, Mayor Tom Barrett and I, and the school board uh, held a press conference because uh, MPS had detected their first case among a staff member. And then of course, there was additional precautions and concerns about exposure to children and other um, faculty at that school location. Dr. Posley and the school board immediately acted um, and uh, suspended in-person uh, education after that point in time, and they still will be closed. And I know that they're still planning for a phased reopening, um, virtual moving into um, in-person this uh, school year. So the reason why I'm bringing this up is because of the risk. Again, as Dr. Weston noted, there's a lot of research uh, that still needs to be conducted, but whatever happens, we're learning more about COVID. We know that children can be um, very vulnerable and at risk. We also know that children can spread a virus to other people that may have more difficulties um, fighting it because of their immune system due to age or underlying health conditions. So we're obviously concerned about faculty and staff, as well as our loved ones, parents, grandparents, and whoever else helps to uh, provide support to children. So I just wanted to just acknowledge that moment that we all care about the well-being of our kids and our families. So we have to be mindful about the way that we go about doing this. So uh, you know the city of Milwaukee still has orders. So our orders went into effect on the 14th of May. So after the Wisconsin Supreme Court ruling, where we felt it was important to still have orders in the city of Milwaukee, as the surrounding areas moved to guidelines. But at the end of the day, we had um, some agreement as to uh, establishing a gating criteria for how we would move or advance through the phases. Some of the elements of that um, table have been preserved along the way. However, since we still have orders, every time we issue a new order, the table is revised to reflect the new order. The order is based off of uh, levels of risk and the situation at that current moment. 
So on the 25th of June was when the phase four order was released. And that's when the table was updated. The health department learned last week that there were some older versions of the table. So the version that was um, developed for phase three were circulating and that created some confusion. Uh, mercury retrograde, whatever you want to call it, we discovered that there was this uh, tech issue, so we resolved it once it was brought to our attention. But at the end of the day, the order is, is what matters. That's the legal document. So the table was developed to provide like a quick and dirty of this is what's going on, but the order is what needs to be reviewed. The order is available in English, Spanish, and Hmong. So we're very committed to providing um, translated materials whenever we develop them. So we wanna make sure that many of our people in our community are able to understand what's happening. We also provide these media updates on a regular basis. These are on Tuesdays and Thursdays. There's some other standing media engagements that we're involved with, uh, WNOV uh, Wednesday mornings, um, uh, SOC's Facebook Live, uh, we also had uh, one of our Office of Violence Prevention staff on TMJ4 on a regular basis. So, and then of course, uh, through our partners at the Medical College of Wisconsin and MMAC, the variety of webinars and um, sector specific uh, guidance related to um, keeping people safe, depending on your industry. So I say all that because there's a lot of information being shared as it's updated, which can create some um, issues with translation if someone has an older version of something or sees something that was relevant maybe two weeks ago or a month ago because the information is ever changing. So we're trying to stay up with this. We're trying to make sure we're making adjustments along the way. So with that being said, with the phase four order, phase four, as we were preparing to get into it, we're like, okay, it's possible that there may be some summer school, right? So we knew that the state's DPI, Department of Public Instruction, was preparing to issue some reopening guidance. Uh, we also knew that the CDC would be issuing some updated guidance on school reopening. Without those two documents, we didn't feel it was appropriate to allow schools to open at that point in time. Again, June 25th, we're thinking of summer school. We're not thinking of fall yet, because since we have moved from phase three to phase four, we were actually trending in the right direction at that point in time. Shortly after that was when we started to see some um, reversing of some of our uh, positive gains. And in the city of Milwaukee, we have seen some stability in our um, criteria or our gating metrics. However, we do need to continue to monitor this instead of just allowing us to gate all the way into phase five. So phase five is full reopening. Um, of course, you know, we're gonna provide additional education and resources to sectors on how to do that in a safe manner, but we're nowhere near that right now. If anything, we're looking at what are some adjustments we're gonna make between phase four and phase five. So the Milwaukee Health Department is in the process of developing a revised order um, order 4.1, so not five, because remember five is opening. 4.1 will address a number of things. First of all, um, the Milwaukee CARES mask ordinance was passed last week. So that means that there's a contradiction now in phase four's order versus this new one that's in the process of being developed. Uh, the phase four order for masks says strongly recommended, uh, doesn't say that it's required. So that's why that has to be changed. Um, also, as schools are preparing to reopen, and of course, there's been a lot of backlash, there's a lot of misinformation out there uh, that we were doing this in the dark or being malicious, which is totally not the case, that the concern is that there needs to be standard guidance on how to reopen safely. And now that we have that, in part, because DPI issued their updated guidance for schools a couple of days after we issued the phase four order, so we didn't go and make that change immediately because remember we were trending in the right direction. So we were like, oh, well, at this rate we'll be in phase five, so none of this will matter. But obviously that's not the case. We have to be more vigilant at this point. So phase, uh, phase 4.1's order will address the schools and link reopening to following the guidance of the state uh, as well as the CDC. The CDC guidance was scheduled to be released last week. 
So it is delayed. Um, it's important for us to make sure that we're able to review that and make sure that we're marketing what that is so everyone has it and knows how to apply it to their individual situations, with whether they're public or private. Um, the other point that needs to be addressed for uh, the reopening is what happens if you have a kid or a faculty member that's positive for COVID? How do you define an outbreak in a school? Is it just a classroom? Was it a section? Is it a certain grade? All of that needs to be outlined. So that's why it's important for us to make sure we're following standard guidelines on reopening and not just pretty much leaving it for schools to figure out how to do it. It's not, that's not fair. That's, our kids deserve better than that. We have to make sure we're doing it in a mindful and science-based way. So uh, again, that will be included in the phase um, 4.1 order that will be released between this week and next week. The other item that will be included in that 4.1 order is the restaurants and bars. And we know that there's been some talk about this because people are like, well, how do you uh, close schools and open bars? First of all, the 625 date, schools weren't open then for the most part. Um, bars and restaurants are still limited at a capacity in the city of Milwaukee, unless they're a part of the um, COVID safety plan pilot which means that there's a rigorous plan review process, education and uh, consultation from the Milwaukee Health Department's environmental health staff, and then uh, implementing the plan. So, so far, we only have two um, operators that have been approved uh, for this. So we want to make sure that everyone is benefiting from this because it's a seal of approval that you're COVID safe or that your risk of um, spreading COVID-19 is very minimal. Uh, but also that the public is able to know what this means. It's kind of like our food grading system where you can go and see a restaurant has an A or a B versus a lesser grade. You know what that means. So please, if you own a restaurant or a bar, please uh, take advantage of this opportunity because we are discussing making this required but creating some kind of time period for this. Um, you know, everyone is very concerned about dialing back and closing everything back up. So we know that by having these um, additional precautions and safety plans in place, that that is going to uh, be a step in the right direction. Uh, again, we know that there's a lot of information out here. There's a lot of misinformation out here. So as the health department, as your chief public health strategist, we wanna make sure that you have um, credible information so that you can still function, but in a different way. Um, with that being said, um, with school readiness talks, I also want to just highlight a couple of points uh, related to school readiness and that we're far away off from that. Normally, kids have to get their vaccinations and exams and all of these things to be ready for school. And we know that since COVID um, shut a lot of in-person um, medical services down, that many children and families um, are behind on getting what they need for their kids to be ready for in-person school. One thing that we'll highlight today, and I know our, our partner from Children's uh, Wisconsin is on, is immunizations. So whether you believe in them or not, science works, immunization works, it's a hallmark feature of public health. So uh, we want to just highlight that there's been some dramatic declines in immunizations, childhood immunizations, that could create additional outbreaks, which would lead to additional school closures. So getting your kids vaccinated, making sure that they're up to, up to date on their vaccinations is extremely important. So just to give you a sense of uh, the percentage of children that are vaccinated at this point in time, um, according to our records through the Wisconsin Electronic Disease Surveillance System, 60% um, are up to date for their vaccinations. Um, the other concern that we have is when you look at the number of vaccines that are typically administered and the number of clients, and this is uh, through the health department, in 2018, we saw about 6,000. In 2019, we saw about 6,900. And this year, as of today, we've only seen 853. So you can see this is really compromising herd immunity. Um, and the number of clients is, is very consistent with that. We're 2018, 2208, uh, 2019, two, about 2,500, and as of today, uh, for the year of 2020, 323. 
So again, extremely concerning. I don't have the um, elevated blood level uh, information for today, but I will provide it at another um, update. But we are assuming too that um, lead uh, tests are down as well because you have to be present to give the sample to find out your uh, blood lead level. So of course kids have been at home more. There's more um, opportunities for exposure. So we're extremely concerned about this. Um, and it's again, we're just talking about school readiness. It's not just having uh, books and, and school supplies and clothes. It's making sure that the health of the child is where it needs to be so that there's disease prevention in the classroom. So, and then the last thing I want to say, um, again, that I'm the health commissioner for the city of Milwaukee. Um, I received a number of messages since Friday um, from a variety of private schools to be exact. And people that aren't necessarily Milwaukeeans, meaning don't live in the city of Milwaukee, don't live in Milwaukee County, and some of them, their kids don't go to these schools, but have been sending very um, nasty, demeaning messages to my office, alders, the mayor, you name it. And I just want to say this, um, you're entitled to your opinion. Obviously, we're a free country, we have free speech. But when you email or send messages to public officials, those are public records. So that means that anyone, um, especially media, we know very all too well, can request copies of things that we receive. So I can understand that this school topic is very emotional for many people, but just think about whatever you send because the last thing you want is for whatever you sent at three in the morning because you were big bad to be shared publicly. Um, it's not productive. Um, some of these messages we have received have been very productive, such as please reconsider your position. We we're trying to understand more. or We support your decision, but what is the reassessment? You know, things like that. But being like nasty and cruel, that's not going to help anybody in this situation. So thank you all for your cooperation. Like I said, please stay tuned for the revised order 4.1, which will be coming out between this week and next week. Thank you. Thank you, Commissioner Kowalik. And last but not least, we'll hear from Dr. Kristen Bensick with Bayshore Pediatrics. Thank you for joining us. Hi, thank you for having me. Um, just um, going on to what was just said, you know, across the country, there's been a dramatic drop in immunizations. And some of this, it was an unintended consequence of the pandemic. The fact that, you know, clinics shut down with the stay-at-home orders, we weren't able to bring children in for their regular immunization schedules. And that really occurred for a good six to eight weeks. However, all the clinics are up and running and the clinics are safe. And so it is so important that you bring your kids in for their appointments. I have to say, I feel more safe at work than I do going to the grocery store. There's so many safety measures in place. You're going to be screened. You're gonna be socially distanced. There's tons of cleaning going on. We are not letting people sit in the waiting room. We are doing immunization only clinics. So that means you can call your doctor and say, where am I at in my child's immunization schedule? How can I get them caught up? Remember kids get vaccines, two, four, six, nine, 12, 15, 18 months. We also are doing lead tests as we're mentioning. We do them at 12 months, we do them at two, and then depending on where kids live and their um, lead screen, we also do them yearly up until five. Um, we can do those as nurse visits only too. So call your doctor's office, call the Milwaukee Health Department, we can get those vaccines going. Remember another big age for kids is the four-year-old visit. So those kids are getting ready for kindergarten. That's when we booster their measles, mumps, and rubella. That's when we booster their pertussis and we booster their polio. Another big age range for your kids is age 11. We do a Tdap, we do a meningitis at that time. Um, I can't stress enough the importance of vaccines. We have a pandemic. We understand what happens when we don't have vaccines to control this and cause herd immunity. We don't need a measles epidemic again. We don't need a polio epidemic. We know how this devastates our world. And so just bring your kids in and you should feel safe to do so. We're here to take care of you. The other thing I wanna mention again is flu shots. Flu shots are on the horizon. We do not wanna know what's gonna happen when flu hits with COVID. We can prevent flu. And so it's so important that you get your kids vaccinated for flu. Usually those immunizations are available starting in September to early October. 
call your doctor's office and find out when their flu clinics are gonna start. And if you've never done a flu vaccine before, this is the year to do it. We don't wanna test COVID with flu. Um, and I think, you know, once again, just going back to talk to your doctor's office, find out where your kids are at with their immunizations. Do not be as scared of the doctors. We are very safe and we're here to take care of you. And we wanna get our kids back to school and to get back to school, you really need to have your immunizations done. And so I just can't stress enough and any questions you have, please call any of us. We're always here to take care of you and we wanna hear your questions. Thank you, Dr. Bensick. We really appreciate that information and it's especially critical now. So we appreciate having you. We will now move to the question and answer portion of our briefing. And our first few questions come from Laura Linder with TMJ4. And the first one, I think actually several are for Commissioner Kowalik. She asks, have you accepted any exemptions from the phase four order as of yet for certain colleges and universities, especially Marquette and UWM? Yes, so we have been in contact with UWM for a number of weeks. So this is what I say when people say they didn't know about this school uh, um, pro uh, prohibiting in-person classes thing. Uh, we have heard from a number of universities that were reaching out and that were asking us uh, what's going on because you know their schedule starts a little bit earlier than a typical academic uh, 12 schedule which might start you know in September or late August or something like that. Uh, so we have been in talks. Uh, one is UW Milwaukee so we did uh, approve theirs yesterday. So we are accepting plans for review. And when you say, when I say plan, or when you say plan, I just want us to be on the same page. The plan is extremely detailed. It covers all aspects of your operations, from staff training, to allowing accommodations, to tracking accommodations, to how you will conduct business virtually, to how you will um, conduct your operations in the event of an outbreak, how you will message that information. Your cleaning, even down to the cleaning products, is extremely detailed. Uh, and so that, that type of information is what we need to review. And, and I, like I said, we're going to create a 4.1. Uh, so that will be clearly listed that there will be an opportunity for a submission of a plan for review. Um, the other point too is that we want to, like we have done for the restaurants and the bars, is to create a template and some guidance on how to create a plan. We know some schools, they have the resources to put together a plan, they have a consultant, they, you know, they're on it. And some uh, other schools, they don't know where to start. So we don't want to create a disadvantage for schools that don't have that bandwidth. We want to standardize what a a workable plan looks like and then it's not a, a bunch of jargon and science that we want to make sure it's um, translated and that it's uh, it's easy to train and to follow that parents and um, students understand what's happening and then of course having checkpoints and reassessments and evaluation along the way so that information will be rolling out um, when we roll out the 4.1 so between this week and next week we're working on that Okay, and um, Lauren asked two clarifying questions. So do colleges and universities have clearance to reopen for in-person instruction this fall? And as you just started noting about 4.1, um, is there a timeline on when you will decide whether schools can reopen for some kind of in-person instruction? Will you make the decision before school starts so parents and students can adjust their plans? Right, so I just wanna be clear about what that means. So. When we say opening, we're not talking about, bam, everything's back to normal. We're talking about phased. Even with UWM, it's not everybody, all 21,000 students are there. There's a percentage that would be, whatever you can do remotely, that's what you do. And whatever you have to do in person, that's what you do in a, a very distance and mindful way to limit the spread of COVID-19. That's why we need the plants. So reviewing the plan, what is the phase up looking like? That's where the guidance is extremely important. Again, waiting for the CDC, knock, knock, we're waiting for the plan. Um, also, we have the state's DPI, but the state's Department of Health Services is also creating some guidance documents that should be released very, very soon. And that's what is really critical for us. It's like, how are you going to function when you have a kid or a, a faculty member 
or a staff member that has COVID-19. How are you going to do the contact tracing? Everything. It's extremely involved and detailed, and we don't want people to be um, overwhelmed, you know, with when you say plan. So I just wanted to uh, provide some uh, more detail on what we mean by that so that there's a shared understanding and using the term plan. All right, the next one is for Commissioner Kowalik. <laughs> Get your water bottle here, we got a few. So uh, the next one is from Emily Files with WUWM. And she says that school leaders in private K-12 colleges and MPS have said that they were unaware of the change to the order that moved school reopening to phase five. Why didn't the health department communicate the restrictions to schools? So we did communicate that in our updated information. So every Friday we have media advisories. So those media advisories are based off of our uh, key indicators, where we're at for the week. We do that on like later on Thursday, that aligns with the county's um, key indicators. And then Friday is when we roll us out. And I must say, you know, people are saying, oh, we didn't know about it. But if you really think about it, at the end of June, what was going on then? You know, we were on, on track to fully reopen for when people started looking at what's going on with schools. I mean, we've had um, our deputies uh, being engaged and responding to questions from principals from various schools. Um, my understanding is if you take MPS out, there's 128 private schools in the city of Milwaukee. When you add MPS, that gets us to about 300 schools. I only have two people working on this. So we are trying to do our best and communicate. That's why having um, these webinars and hitting various groups to help spread the word has been really helpful. There's actually a meeting happening right now. Um, MMAC is um, convening the meeting, but it's all like school administrators and some elected officials to walk through what's happening. And they should be watching right now because I know they have many questions of like, just watch the media briefing and then I'll join their meeting and um, help answer some more questions that they have. So of course, you know, you put information out, um, out of sight, out of mind. There was a lot of emphasis on like childcare programs and um, summer camps and youth development programs around that time. So I think with that focus that I took away from some of the, oh yeah, school's closed, because you're not gonna start planning for reopening school until like now. I mean, we have people that are really ramped up right now. Um, so we are concerned about some of the optics in that that are saying we didn't tell anybody. And then again, where I have people saying they didn't know about it and their arms are crossed and their brows furrowed, but they don't live in our area. So you have to seek out the information in the area that you may be doing business in. So like I said, I'm the health officer in the city of Milwaukee. If you live in Delavan, like how are you gonna know what I'm saying if you're not seeking it out? Um, if you're doing business in the city, you should also be following what's happening in the city. Our website again is wonky.gov slash MMFS, moving Milwaukee forward safely. We also have a presence on all social media platforms except for um, Snapchat. And I don't know if we have TikTok yet. We are talking about it, but it's just MKE Health. Uh, so please follow us and you'll get updated information. Um, we definitely know that there was uh, one administrator in particular that kind of kicked this whole thing off and I'm not gonna say their name or put them out there, but they obviously were very charged with emotion uh, we also are aware that some of the private schools were very uh, taken aback because they were like, well, you're looping us in with the public schools. And we're like, you're in our jurisdiction. We don't see public and private. We see it as schools. And that's how the order was written. Um, so just like if you're doing business in the city of Milwaukee, you can have businesses in other jurisdictions, but you're bound to the um, regulations or whatever of the jurisdiction where you're doing business. So um, I just wanted to clarify that because I did see that narrative and that's that's an unfortunate narrative, but we have been putting information out. We can always do better, um, but we have a small team, as I noted, and um, we are working on hiring more staff with our CARES Act funding 
and really creating a true communications team, bringing more people on board because COVID obviously is going to be a part of our life for some time to come. Emily's follow-up question is, will Milwaukee schools, including colleges, be allowed to reopen in the upcoming school year if they have a safety plan in place that follows the CDC and DPI guidelines? Or will that be contingent on gating criteria that are not currently met? Yeah, so that's a good question. We are constantly re reviewing and revising this criteria because the way it's set up now, it's like, if we're stable, for every 14 days or incubation period, then stable meaning yellow or, or green and any of the five indicators. So the cases, the testing, the PPE, the access to healthcare and the contact tracing, then technically we could advance to uh, the next phase, which means we would already be in phase five. Um, obviously that is not the move right now <laughs> because of what's happening uh, to just say, well, we created this document and we're bound by it. No, we authored the document so we have the ability to make adjustments based off of our information on what's going on, our reservations and concerns about moving too quickly, because it says moving Milwaukee forward safely. Um, and then also as we receive more uh, information about COVID-19 and how it moves and how it spreads and who's mostly impacted or not. So um, again, our, our other point too is the Milwaukee CARES and mask ordinance, that that just went into effect last night. Uh, not last night, but last week. So we got to give that a little bit of time to kick in, right? There's still um, a mask um, distribution plan that we're working on. We're planning on having that done by the end of the month. Um, but getting masks to everyone in the city of Milwaukee, because we're charged with doing that due to the resolution that our um, alders has um, developed for us or have developed for us. So. You know, we need to also take advantage of some of these policy tools that we have to help prevent the spread of COVID-19. Uh, but again, there's very specific um, considerations that need to be made for each sector. And as we're preparing for back to school, we're, we're looking at this and we're like, look, we wanna make sure you know what, the, what a plan means, that you have the resources to develop a plan, that we're reviewing your plan, so it gives you the opportunity to ask any questions or for us to clarify, and then you are able to implement the plan and we provide technical assistance and support along the way. So uh, that's what that's, this is about. Um, the phasing of schools, like the gating, the, that's for the entire city at large. So that's why uh, we will continue to revise that along the way. And I've said this before, so I'm, I'll say it again, and maybe every time I address the media, I need to say it, that the gating criteria will be updated according to the latest orders um, to make sure that it's relevant and that it's pacing us um, to where we need to be so we're not being too, too um, aggressive in our reopening plan. All right, the next question is for Commissioner Kowalik from Brittany Lewis with CBS 58. It is more about mandatory masking. So she says, there seems to be confusion on the mask ordinance and gyms and fitness studios. Some are requiring people to wear them while exercising, others are not. Under the ordinance, are people required to keep their masks on inside a gym, inside a gym even if they're six feet apart from another person? Yeah, so the reason why we have that in there, again, is the research and looking at where we're at right now. Uh, we have received a number of inquiries about this where people are like, I can't work out with a mask. And personally, I, I've had to just get different types of masks for working out. You know, some are, are, yeah, definitely harder to breathe in than others. But we haven't made that formal adjustment yet because remember this just happened last week so we're um, taking information we're looking at research right now we're saying that anytime you're out of your house you should be wearing a mask if possible um, if you aren't able to we are creating this exception process for various um, medical conditions that's being reviewed by our legal team right now but you know we know that uh, there it has been um, outbreaks related to gyms and again, it's related to the force of the breathing and the spread of the droplet. 
uh, like we had one question about um, workout instructor having to wear a mask. Well, if you know workout instructors, like I know workout instructors, they're shouting, there's a lot of droplets spreading going on from instructors. So definitely like wearing a mask is more often than not, they're not working out as hard as you are. They're just making sure you're doing it. Uh, but that's a lot of exposure, of uh, potential exposure through um, shouting instructions. Uh, but for some people that, depending on the types of exercise, if it's kind of low exertion versus high exertion, that's where we see a need to create some uh, more clarity on that. So right now we're saying, um, whenever you're out of your house, wear a mask. If you're uh, working out, you're having challenges, Perhaps you can be somewhere where you cannot wear the mask and not be exposed to other people. You know, I don't know how gyms are setting up their times if they're doing re reservations. Like my gym, you have to um, reserve when, what time you'll be there. So then it's not a big deal um, if you're wearing a mask or not because there's time in between uh, people. But I know every gym is not doing that. So um, we want to continue to provide support to our fitness community because, of course, we're the health department. We uh, support physical activity, and we know that's a great way to manage stress and all of that. So we will provide an update on that. Again, Milwaukee Cares just went into effect last week, and we're not at the week market for this ordinance. So we will be providing an update. So thank you. Thank you, and we'll, we'll give you a break. Our next question is from New 4 with WISN 12. I'll direct it to Dr. Weston. He's asking, do you want people to quarantine while they wait for their COVID test results? Yeah, so we'd want them either to quarantine or, or isolate. And those are two terms that are often confused. So, so quarantine are for people without symptoms, but who've had close contact with someone with COVID-19. So the CDC defines close contact as within six feet of someone um, who has COVID-19 for at least 15 minutes. So basically we're talking about you had physical contact, you touched them, you hugged them, uh, you sat down and had a meal with them, um, things like that. Uh, and so that would be when you'd want to quarantine regardless of symptoms. Um, isolation is for people with symptoms of COVID-19. So anyone with symptoms of COVID-19, we want them to isolate. But either way, the, the idea is distance yourself from uh, really everyone else so that you don't spread the disease. So if you have symptoms, we want you to isolate. If you don't have symptoms, we'd want you to quarantine if you've had close contact. Uh, but either way, the, the point is, if you're getting a test because you have a high level of concern one way or another, we want you to separate yourself from others. That's an yeah. excellent point of clarity. Oh, and yes, Commissioner Koala. Well, even like uh, the latest with our, our beloved uh, Milwaukee Bucks, where we have two players uh, that have, um, you know, noted their status for um, being COVID-19 positive, where they're like, well, what are you doing? How are you doing? I just wear a mask. Like, you know, you can have, know that you have COVID, wear a mask, know that you don't have COVID, or you may be asymptomatic, still wear a mask. You don't know that if you have it or not. So it's just a way, again, for all of us to limit the spread of COVID-19 by normalizing mask wearing. Absolutely. And our, our next question is from Dan Malloy with Spectrum News. Um, perhaps Commissioner Kowalik, you're able to answer this. He says that the Brewers are not ruling out allowing fans this season. Is that overly optimistic? And aside from a change in MLB policy, what needs to happen before Miller Park can allow fans? Yes, yeah, so just like uh, how I, I've referenced UWM, you know, like there's regular meetings that we have with certain groups that have been reaching out and they have been proactive. So they reached out to us a while ago in, and we're able to get some things on the books. So um, definitely having uh, regular conversations with them on their plan, what does, um, you know, powering up look like. Um, our concern though is about fans where we know that being in a um, arena or sporting setting that that can be an exposure risk. So uh, we're, we're seeing the trend right now uh, in the country, like having events with fans is just not uh, wise right now. So, you know, we will continue to provide that update. They do follow our, our, our gating. They go to our website. They see, you know, what's going on. So we just want to, again, reiterate the importance of staying current, knowing that the health department and the county are updating information every Thursday and that we're sending out our media advisory every Friday, which explains exactly what is happening. We also provide updates at our public safety and health um, committee hearing, uh, and that's um, 
it seems like every three weeks or so, but lately it seems like every week I'm up providing COVID updates. And then also our board of health meetings, which are every month. So there's opportunities to get some more detailed information about what's happening aside from these regular media updates. Excellent. Emily Files has another question, Emily Files with w UWM, and she's asking, is it, for Commissioner Qualic, is it correct to say that the health department put the restriction on school reopenings in place for Order 4, thinking it would not affect fall plans because numbers were trending in the right direction? Well, yeah, that, and then again, with the summer school, we, we did that. We're like, okay, what do we have to worry about right now in summer school? And we're heading in the right direction so this should be a non-issue right but obviously that ended up not being the case um COVID has been uh, the major plot twist for everyone in the world that when you think you have it figured out it throws a curveball your way so um I, i'm glad that that question was posed um you know we were just focusing on that immediate uh, moment in time as well as waiting for the reopening guidelines we don't we never want to just say you're fine, do whatever. Well, we know that as government, we have an obligation to give you resources to do, do so in a way that's gonna protect you and um, whoever you serve. So um, the fact that we didn't have that information at that point in time was why we said that. We knew it was coming, but we didn't think we would be in this direction right now, so. Our next question is from Suzanne Spencer with Fox 6, and she says it's for any of our health professionals on the call. She said, what do local health officials make of the largest single day increase in new cases? Do you believe Milwaukee County is to blame for this? That's the Wisconsin increase or the Milwaukee County increase that we're referring to? Yeah, I was like, what's the... the Suzanne, if you want to chat me or if you want to come online and clarify, you are welcome to. Hi, everyone. Yeah, I'm referring to the Wisconsin Department of Health Services increase of more than 1,000 new cases today, which I believe marks the single uh, highest increase so far we've seen in this state. Yes, so we're very concerned. I mean, again, we've been looking at other areas and looking at what's happening in our area. So that's always going to guide um, our process and our decision making and if we're going to have to dial things back and what does that look like that's still being refined right now um, we want to make sure we're in alignment with um, our suburban public health professionals as well um, granted there's guidance and orders but we still want to have the same um, recipe if you will yeah and i would just add to that i think in the beginning of the pandemic we saw milwaukee county having the largest burden of disease uh, by far, but as the pandemic has, has gone on, uh, we've seen that it's affecting just about every county um, in Wisconsin. There's a, a much more even spread um, across counties. So really, as we know, as we've learned, uh, some communities are certainly more affected, but there's no boundaries to, to who's uh, affected, where COVID-19 is transmitted. So certainly, Milwaukee County, we're seeing high numbers, we're seeing concerning numbers, uh, but there's lots of other areas of the state that are as well. And Rebecca Clough uh, for Team J4 was asking a similar question, so I'll ask the second piece. Um, so as the numbers are increasing, have we been tracking or tracing back to summer camps, restaurants, or anything that might correlate with these increasing cases? Yeah, Dr. Weston, I don't know if you want to talk about the county and then I can dial back into the city. Sure, I mean, I can talk about the numbers in general. So we said we saw the highest increase um, percentage wise uh, over the last two weeks in that 10 to 19 year old age group, we saw 84% increase. Um, the next highest increase was in the 77, 70 to 79 year old age group. Um, and then we're also seeing pretty substantial ones uh, in another young age group, 20 to 29. So I think the take home point is there's a lot of transmission um, in the younger age groups. I, I think we found in the past, it's difficult to trace that. And I'll, I'll let Commissioner Kowalik expand on this, but it's really difficult to trace that to you got it when you were standing in this bar. You got it when you, uh, you know, went into this grocery store or this restaurant or whatever it is. Um, but we know one way or another you got it through close contact. Uh, and we know young people engage in a lot more close contact in bars, uh, at parties, at beaches, at all sorts of places than our older population. But I think that that increase in that 70 to 79-year-old age group shows that 
uh, again, the, the younger age groups are not in isolation. Uh, they transmit it to their parents, their neighbors, their coworkers, their grandparents. Uh, and so we will see the repercussions in other age groups as well. Mm -hmm. And the point about where we're seeing outbreaks. So, you know, the questions about restaurants and bars, we haven't seen that as a primary source in our community, meaning in the city of Milwaukee. Uh, what we have been seeing though, is um, little uh, outbreaks here and there related to, um, we do have a fitness facility. Um, also, uh, group homes uh, have been shown to have some outbreaks. And then of course, like random parties. So people are, you know, just getting together, having parties. Acknowledged. And there we go. And that's the concern because the messaging again, we're looking at appealing to younger audiences. Like this is something that you should be mindful of. It may not take you out. It could take out someone you love, or it could possibly take you out because we're learning more about COVID and it causing issues uh, among people that are extremely healthy, no health issues, no previous health issues, and they're struggling for their lives. So, um, you know, we're working with uh, the Joint Information Center as well as our other um, marketing and communications consultants that thankfully we have funding uh, for because there has to be adjusted messaging along the way. So we've done that with our African American and our Latinx communities here, as well as many other, um, our indigenous and other groups uh, that need more specific messaging, more relevant messaging, but the need to create more um, specific dose messaging for our younger adults and adolescents needs to happen. So um, that is in the works. Uh, so stay tuned for some of those um, messages once they come out. And as we get close to an hour, I'm going to blend a few questions uh, as we conclude. Some, uh, I apologize if any reporter's specific question isn't answered, um, but I'm going to try to paraphrase them so we can get through it here. Um, the, some of the final questions in four in phase 4.1, will schools be able to open in person? And what capacity does the health department have to ensure schools are following their plans? Yes, with an approved plan. Uh, and that again, there's going to be limitations on capacity. Our other point is making sure that accommodations are offered and honored. Uh, we know that some people are high risk. Uh, some people, uh, some children are high risk and we don't want them to be forced into uh, a setting where they might be exposed. So uh, we do need to see uh, some evidence of accommodation and how will that be tracked and how will that be followed and what type of virtual uh, resources will be made available for those that opt uh, not to uh, be present in person. So uh, just putting that out there that that will be a part of the plan requirement. Uh, and also, again, looking at where we're at um, as far as providing support from the health department as we're bringing on hundreds of staff, uh, thanks to this additional funding that we're receiving from the federal government, uh, we're using it to actually bring staff on as auxiliary uh, appointments. And then also we're using a temp service that we normally use, which will be extremely helpful uh, for us because again, we've said this many times that our health department has been like average joe's uh which uh it was, it was the gym and one of my favorite movies dodgeball we, you know we're just all struggling along in our own unique ways but we want to step our game up uh so we have the resources to be able to do that but of course uh hiring and bringing folks on board and training them takes a little bit of time so we're on warp speed here accelerating the process to get people on board. We will um, be very um, vocal and share these job opportunities. So if you are interested in helping uh, uh, public health in, in your community or in the city of Milwaukee, uh, definitely consider applying for some of these vacancies that will be popping up. So aside from contact tracing, there will be um, positions for um, specialists of different types. Um, communications, people, outreach workers, um, different types of um, more like data analysis, epidemiologists, things like that. So there'll be a variety of positions and opportunities to join uh, the movement to uh, prevent the spread of COVID-19 in our community. So 
Um, so any help from the media will be great in getting those uh, opportunities out. All right, and our last question is for Commissioner Kowalik. It's a follow-up question from Suzanne Spencer with Fox 6. She says, can you specify which fitness facility has an outbreak and was this after the mask mandate went into effect? Yeah, I need to get more details on that. I was just briefed about that this morning. Um, so we are uh, getting that additional information. So um, I know Suzanne's been great with inquiring about information like the long-term care facilities and whatnot. So we will be following up. Excellent, thank you. And that concludes our briefing for today. Thank you all. Thank you, Commissioner Koala, for fielding the questions. <laughs> uh, and we appreciate it. We'll see everyone on Thursday. Thanks, everyone. Thanks.